and uh, welcome everybody for this uh, today's uh, CCQ colloquium, which will be given by Roy Osiri from the Weizmann Institute, as you can see here. And uh, uh, Roy is actually one of the official collaborators also of the CCQ. Actually, when we long time ago made an application, <laughs> <laughs> and we really hope that this is not a one one time uh, event where we meet uh, in person. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, we expect to have a lot of collaboration also in the future. And, uh, and as you can see from the, the, the topic here uh, of today's talk, it's about all the coal atom ion interaction. And it's actually telling, I think, everything about your background in science. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, Roy started doing uh, uh, quantum gas experiments in the uh, Davidson group as a, a PhD student and finished that in about 2003, yes, I think I remember. <laughs> and then uh, he, he moved on to say that, okay, now I really have to do something real serious. And then I lost, an, I lost an electron. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you have to take off an electron. And then he moved to uh, the violence group in NIST and worked there as a postdoc for four years or something like this. Uh, after which, I mean, he was really, I think, uh, more or less uh, Hijacked back to <laughs> to Weizmann Institute uh, in, in various positions, uh, which in 2019 then uh, uh, where he became a, a full professor and at the same time more or less also got the duty of being the vice uh, uh, director uh, for communication and development uh, uh, at the Weizmann Institute as such. So it's a big task to take over, uh, but. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that uh, your Roy has done very well in this uh, job as well because he has contributed extremely much to the to the field, both in neutral atom and, and ion physics. And so, uh, I think it's kind of natural for you to 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 to, to kind of uh, make these two things together and see what you can get out of it. And that's what we're going to hear about today. So, welcome again, uh, Roy. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. It's the second time I get to visit our house. And last time was a December visit, so I'm very happy to see the other side of the coin. And thanks for organizing such a beautiful weather on my, on my visit. So it's, it's really beautiful. Um, right, so what I uh, thought I'll be telling you about today are uh, ultra-cold atom ion interactions. That's a project that we started in my group in 2009, I believe, so quite a few years ago. Um, what you see here, uh, this little dot here is the fluorescence from a single strontium plus ion. And it's overlapped with an, uh, um, uh, a simultaneous absorption imaging picture, which is taken of a uh, dipole trapped cloud of, of rubidium atoms that surrounds it. So we take single ions and we immerse them in a cloud of ultra cold atoms. Now, why would you call something ultra cold? It's always gen dangerous to give superlatives to situations because what happens next if we cool further, what are we gonna call it? Super duper ultra, so is, but usually when people refer to ultra cold interactions, they refer to a situation where at least in the, in the case of two, two body interactions, when you think of many body interactions, of course there's other energy scales that come in. When you think of the two body problem, then cooling further would not change the essence of the interaction. That happens usually when you cool such that the, uh, the Broglie wavelength in the center of mass frame is already larger than any you know, typical size of potential interaction between these two particles, and then you're dominated by a single parameter that, you know, that governs the behavior of the collision, the S-wave scattering, uh, scattering of, of the problem. So it's like scattering a laser from a target which is much smaller than the laser wavelength. So, this is the tale that I'll, I'll describe here, which is ultra-cold, or at least towards ultra-cold interactions between, between atoms and ions. So I, I started off by saying that this is something that we started working on in, in, in 2009, which means it's already a third generation of graduate students that have been working uh, on, this, on this difficult, I should say, experiment. And before I forget, I want to... Uh, recognize uh, all the names of the heroes, uh, the hardworking heroes who were brave enough to embark on this on this project. Um, yeah, I don't know if you recognize Ziv Meir, who was one of the first PhD students on this on this experiment. Recently, also returned to the Weizmann Institute uh, to perform quantum logic spectroscopy of molecules. Um, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> 
So trapped ions versus neutral atoms. So I think that you know, both these systems have been laser cooled many, many years ago. Trapped ions were cooled at the end, laser cooled at the end of the 1970s. A few years later, neutral atoms were laser cooled as well. And these two systems are cooled to the, to the, you know, to the quantum regime, but have been used to rather different, different ends, if you like. Trapped ions are extremely well coherently quantum controlled systems. You know, you can actually interact with them one by one. Uh, people have used them to build extremely precise atomic clocks. They're a very highly leading platform for quantum computing. They're heavily used in precision measurements. Their interaction, though, is rather trivial. You know, the interaction between these ions is the Coulomb interaction. It's long range. In a sense, it's classical. So for example, the spin statistics of the ions doesn't matter at all. And that's because their wave functions don't overlap. So the question of whether you're using fermions or bosons as, as a trapped ion platform doesn't come into play at all, at all. We think of their interaction in full classical terms. The only quantum thing in their interaction is then the phonons. You know, the phonons in, within the normal modes is what we think about as, as quantum, quant, in quantum terms. But the interaction between the ions is, is fully classical. In neutral atoms is actually the, you know, quite the opposite. Um, people, um, so you know, right from the onset, the interactions between neutral atoms was the quantum thing that people have been, have been looking at. Without that, those interactions, I think atomic systems would be rather boring. But you know, you know, a few years or a decade after people were able to laser cool cold atoms, then people have been able to cool them further to quantum degeneracy to look at both BC as well as Fermi degenerate gas. Again, in both these examples, without interactions, that would be a tremendously boring system. But you know, interactions drive Fermi degenerate gases into superfluidity, uh, and BC has a rich excitation spectrum. And using these systems, um, now people have looked, or not now, 20 years already, in, on the superfluid Mott insulator uh, transition. So people have been emulated condensed matter systems. Um, in the last decade or so, people have been looking on dipolar gases where the interactions become longer and longer range. In fact, with dipolar gases, you can't get to that ultra cold or if like to the S wave regime where there's only one partial wave uh, dominating the interactions. So these are rather different systems and, and since about 2009, people have started mixing trapped ions and, and, uh, uh, and ultra cold gases. And you might ask yourself, why would that be interesting? Why go in that direction? And I think the, one of the honest answers is because we can. And it hasn't been studied before, and it's a new playground. So we let's play. Uh, and that's always, I think, you know, when I say that, and people say, no, you're a scientist. You need a very good reason to do something. You say, no, I think that's a very good reason. I think if there is a new playground that we can play in, and we can drive it into unexplored territories, even if we don't know exactly what we'll find, it's a very good reason to do it. Another good reason uh, to study these is that their chemistry hasn't been explored in the, in, in the cold or ultra cold regime. And their chemistry is very interesting and even important. That's the chemistry that dominates interstell interstellar molecular formation. And the reason for that is that ion ion interaction you know, is repulsive. So that's not going to lead to any chemistry. Neutral neutral uh, interactions are very short range. And that's why they're not going to lead to very efficient chemistry in interstellar medium. But ion neutral is long range, and therefore that's the main driving force behind generating interstellar molecular formation. And if you want to understand <coughs> that chemistry, that's a very good system to do that. Another motivation is that ions can serve as a highly localized. We already said that ions are extremely good local probes. They're very good sensors. They can be coherently controlled with extreme accuracy. In this case, ions can be extremely highly localized, but then extremely controlled and precise probes of ultra cold gases. And that's, that would be a useful tool, if you like, a local microscope of an ultra cold gas. And then, you know, there's the, the entire spectrum of reasons of studying ultra cold many body matter in general, which is emulation of condensed matter systems. And, you know, I know Georg here has been working and thinking, Georg there, I'm sorry, has been thinking of ideas along these lines of using these ions as charged polarons uh, with long-range interactions, looking at mediated interactions, uh, 
such as the Ruderman Kitel Kasuda Yoshida, RKKY and condensed matter between these, between these impurities, condo crystals, and there are many, many more examples of spin impurities or other impurities in condensed matter systems with rich, rich many body behavior. So we have a motivation and since 2009 there have been more and more labs uh, working on these mixed systems and this is, this is here a list, I hope, <clears throat> I, I apologize if it's not completely full, but it shows many, many groups. One of the things that you'll see here is A, it's all in the northern hemisphere, um, but that means nothing really. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is that it's a very plural, very democratic world. So unlike the world of neutral atoms or ions at least 10 years ago or so where you would see rubidium and rubidium and rubidium and maybe a little bit potassium, here the, you know, there's, at least it's a, bi, it's a two body problem. You need to choose one of both and there are many, many choices and different choices show different physics. So it's, it's a very, you know, there are many, many options to to choose from, and the reason I, I put some of them in black and some of them in red is that you, know, you could try and mix atoms in a mott and overlap them with an ion trap, um, and that's, that's good and it's, it's even easier technically, but it's not gonna be able to drive you into the ultra cold regime, because in a mott the temperatures are, are much, much higher. We'll see soon that they're way too high in order to study these, these interactions. Um, and secondly, because the, the atoms are never in the ground state, they're always excited on, S, on an S2P transition. All the experiments in red are experiments in which the atoms are not just laser cooled in a mott, but then trapped in dipole uh, potentials, evaporatively cooled to lower temperatures. These are all experiments that are trying to drive this atom ion systems into the, into the, into the ultra cold regime. So a few, um, a few introductory remarks on, on ion neutral interactions. Actually, that problem was initially you know, thought of um, classically, actually, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century by Paul Angevin. Um, and Paul Angevin has shown that uh, when you look at the interaction between an ion and a neutral atom, if the collision between these two happens above a certain critical impact parameter, then all that happens is that the atom is slightly deflected in the interaction potential and not much momentum is being transferred. I, by the way, I forgot to say that the interaction between a charged particle and a neutral atom, which has a polarizability, goes like minus one over R to the fourth. The reason is very simple. Uh, this is a dipole, it's, it's the interaction between the field of a charged particle and a dipole but because the dipole moment is proportional to the field, it's induced by the field, the interaction goes like minus the polarizability times the field square. Because the field of a charged particle goes like one over R squared, this interaction goes like minus one over R to the fourth. So it's much softer than the van der Waals minus one over R to the sixth interaction at long, at long range. If the collision happens below this critical impact parameter, then in the center of mass, you get a spir spiraling in. Of, of the relative coordinate until a very short range collision occurs. And then the two separate pretty much, pretty much isotropically. These are collisions where momentum transfer is very, very, um, is very efficient. These are also the collisions that govern chemistry or any inelastic collision rates because most of these inelastic or collisions or chemical reactions need short range interaction uh, to take place. One interesting feature about the Langevin rate is that the Langevin cross-section is proportional to one over the square root of the energy or one over the velocity. And because the rate goes like uh, the density times the cross-section times the velocity, the cross-section times the velocity is independent of energy altogether. It's one over the velocity times the velocity. So classically, the Langevin rate is energy independent. And that's a unique feature of the minus one over R to the fourth potential. Now, how do you connect this classical picture to quantum mechanics? Well, in quantum mechanics, the way you calculate the cross-section is by summing over all the partial waves up to the last partial wave that my energy allows for, okay? So a sum from L equals zero to L max. There's some prefactor here of four pi over K squared, where K is the momentum of that collision. And then you sum over each partial wave with a contribution of two L plus one times sine square of phi, 
where phi is the phase that the wave function in the center of mass frame accumulates over the molecular potential, okay, back and forth. Now, if I have many, many partial waves, that's going towards the classical regime, each partial wave contributes a random phase, okay, because the phase you acquire is many, many 2 pi. It's a very deep interaction potential. And then this sine square, the sum over the, this sine square samples the interval between zero and one arbitrarily, and that sum averages to one half. And actually, if you take that sum, uh, actually within a factor of two, which doesn't matter where that comes from, you recover, you recover the classical Langevin, Langevin cross-section. So that's the connection between the, the, uh, the classical and the quantum Langevin uh, description. Now, as we said, if, if we cool sufficiently low, instead of having many partial waves contributing to the collision, I'm going to have a single partial wave that my energy would allow for, that would be the S wave, the zero angular momentum state. That would happen when the collision energy would be below the centrifugal barrier of the P wave, of the partial wave with a single quanta of angular momentum, okay? Now in neutral atoms, if you ask yourself, where does that happen? You have, you have, to, you have to look at the, at the energy barrier of the P wave, and that happens, well, it happens at, 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 uh, at um, well, we can get to that, Lens scale soon, uh, it happens this centrifugal barrier for the van der Waals minus one over r to the six potential happens in neutral atoms typically at a distance of a few nanometers. Okay, that's, that's the reason that the scattering length for rubidium is about 100, 100 bore. It's about five nanometers, okay? And the energy you need in order to be below that centrifugal barrier is typically hundreds of microkelvin. What does it mean? It means that all you need is a magneto-optical trap with a little bit of Sisyphal schooling, and boom, you're in the, you're in the S wave regime, okay? You're already in the quantum regime. The minus one of our the fourth potential is actually much softer. And because it's much softer, the length scale at which the cent this centrifugal barrier shows up is much, much longer, larger. It's for us, for rubidium strontium plus, which is the mixture we use, it happens at about quarter of a micron. What does it mean? It means that you need to cool to energies of tens of nano Kelvin in order to drive your, yourself into the, into the S, wave, S wave regime. You need to be much, much, much colder. Another observation, which would become later on in the talk, is that this length scale is much, much longer than the length scale over which chemistry happens, okay? The, the area where the molecular potentials are, are significant, okay? Centrifugal forces act very far away from the, from the center of origin. And this is a very different situation than the situation you have in neutral atoms, where five nanometers are slightly larger, but not very, very large. You know, they're 100 bore. They're not 10,000 bore. Okay, so how, how do we know that we have, uh, you know, we're in the quantum regime? Usually we see that the cross-section, remember I told you that the Langevin cross-section is energy independent. That's clearly not the case when you hit the quantum regime. So for example, one of the first things that you, you're a, you should be able to see is a phenomena that happens when the collision energy matches a, a quasi-bound state, which is bound by the centrifugal barrier of one of the partial waves. Okay, this is a little bit like a, a, a fabri perot resonator for, for matter waves. When that happens, we get a, a, a resonance enhancement of the collision, the collisional cross-section. So for example, we can measure that by uh, resonant enhancement of all sorts of inelastic, inelastic collisions. These resonances are example of, of these examples are, are called uh, shape resonances. But there are the resonances that people observe like Feshbach resonances and so on. So when we go to the quantum regime, we see a significant effect of wave dynamics on the collision between the ion and, and the atoms. Well, I'll show you later how we tune it. We tune it by putting the atoms in an optical lattice and then changing the frequency difference between the two optical lattice beams and then controlling the velocity with which the atoms are, are, are being transported across the trapped ion. So, yeah, I told you that we have um, Elastic collisions, we also have inelastic collisions. So one other particular aspect of these systems, and that's common to most systems, not all systems. For strontium plus and rubidium, if you look at the, at the entrance channel to the collision, uh, 
it's not, and this is this channel here, rubidium in the S ground state and strontium plus in the S ground state. This is not the molecular ground state. The reason it's not the molecular ground state is because both these guys are alkalized. They have one free electron and they're very reactive. They're chemically crazy, okay? And then if I take the electron from rubidium and transfer it to strontium, I'm gonna get rubidium plus, which is a noble atom. It has only closed shells, so a lower energy configuration. And I'm gonna get a paired electron pair in the ground state of strontium, which again is energetically favorable. So if I look at, uh, at this option, it's actually way below, it's optically. There's an IR photon that separates the ground state of strontium rubidium plus from the ground state of strontium plus and rubidium. So we're not colliding at the ground state of, this, of these molecular potentials. And that's why, and this is a movie uh, that I can show you, if we, if we put eight ions uh, in, within this cloud, you see that slowly ions disappear from the crystal, but their fluorescence disappears. They're still there because you can see that the ions hop around around empty spaces. So you can fit a one over E curve to that decay of fluorescence. The reason fluorescence decays is because strontium plus, which are susceptible to scattering photons from that resonant uh, laser beam become rubidium plus and then they're not, they're not scattering photons any longer. And we measure that about, 10 to, about 10, every 10 to the four Langevin collisions, radiatively a photon is emitted from the singlet entrance channel to the ground state singlet and the electron hops from strontium plus, strontium plus to rubidium. So a few words about our experimental system. This is our machine. It's composed out of two vacuum chamber. In the lower chamber, we have an RF pole trap. We trap single or few trapped strontium plus ions. We collect atoms in the upper chamber in a magneto-optical trap. We move them uh, into an optical dipole trap in which we evaporatively cool them and then we transfer them into a one-dimensional vertical optical lattice. And then by changing the frequency between these two vertical beams, we transport the atoms 25 centimeters from the upper chamber to the lower chamber when we either leave them in the lattice or move them to a cross-dipole trap and overlap them, overlap them with, a, uh, with, a trapped, with a trapped ion. It takes about uh, 0.3 seconds or so. A few times a second, we can transport them down to the cloud. So using this system, uh, we actually did all sorts of experiments. We looked at non-equilibrium dynamics, spin dynamic, excitation exchange, um, the dephasing of optical clock transitions, and so on. What I'd like to concentrate today uh, in telling you about is my, mainly uh, non-equilibrium dynamics and spin dynamics, and maybe end with some quantum logic detection of, of collisions between these two species. Good, so the first thing we looked at is what happens when the atoms, the cloud of atoms, collides elastically with a single trapped ion. So usually uh, you would think of this problem as, you know, the ion would thermalize with a bath of neutral atoms around it. So if I start with the ion, let's say, uh, I started with millikelvin temperatures after Doppler cooling, but I overlap it with a cloud of atoms at microkelvin temperatures, what I expect is the ion to thermalize with the atoms at microkelvin micro temperatures. This naive picture, however, does not hold. And the reason it doesn't hold is because we don't trap ions in static potentials. And the reason we don't trap ions in static potential is, is Laplace equations, which requires that the second order derivative of the electric, electro, ele electric potential would be equal zero. That means that if we, in two dimensions we have a trapping potential, in the third dimension, we're going to have an anti-trapping potential with the sum of quadratures of both traps. So it's not a stable configuration. So you can see here that if we, uh, you know, if we increase the voltage on, on these two electrodes and we have trapping fields, we'll have uh, field lines going in the opposite direction, providing anti-trapping. So the reason, the, the way we trap ions is by using non-static fields. We oscillate electric fields very, very quickly, much quicker than the ion can respond. So we generate a quadruple uh, field configuration and we oscillate it back and forth. And when we do that, and this is again another movie, you can see that if the field lines oscillate faster than the ion can respond, the ion would be repelled from the large amplitude 
RF regions into low amplitude RF regions. And this provides a staple trapping mechanism as long as the harmonic frequency of oscillation within these quadrupole potentials is much, much smaller than the RF frequency. And we refer to this parameter as the Q parameter, or the, Ma the Matthew Q parameter, because it shows in a Matthew equation, which is behind this mechanism. And as long as Q is much, much smaller than one, we get stable confinement. So if you look at the solution, this is a classical solution of ion motion in the trap, we see that it, it does have uh, an amplitude of oscillation at some secular frequency. This is the effective harmonic potential that traps the ion. But on top of that, we have an additional term of oscillation at the RF frequency. And this is driven motion, okay? So how would that motion look like if I have some thermal motion in the trap? Whenever the ion is in the RF null, it's not gonna see any driven motion. You see the driven motion is proportional to this prefactor. So if this prefactor is zero, I don't have any zero motion. But as the ion is, moves away from the trap center, we see more and more driven motion superimposed on it. Okay, we call this micromotion. So what are the consequences of having micromotion uh, on the thermalization or lack of, of ion being immersed in a cloud of atoms? It means that the ion can collide with the atoms not just due to its thermal motion, but also due to its uh, driven motion. And this mechanism continuously pumps energy into the temperature distribution uh, of the ion. So, wait, I'm missing one. Yeah, I'm missing my slide here, but I'll, I'll skip it anyways. And in fact, uh, theoretical work by the group of Vlad and Vuletic uh, in already in, in 2012 has shown that even if you don't have any intrinsic micromotion, meaning you actually have a zero line of zero RF, of, of zero RF amplitude in the trap, you won't be able to thermalize the ion with the atoms. Naively, you could think, okay, this, this mechanism might be true. I have dri driven motion colliding uh, c c pumping energy uh, into the secular motion of the ion, but I do have a region where the RF amplitude is zero. So if my ion is cold enough, it's not go going to experience any driven motion. And therefore collisions with the atoms should thermalize it. So that should be a stable solution to my equations. This theory work has suggested that that's not the case. And the reason is that the minus one over R to the fourth potential is sufficiently long range such that when the atom and ion become, the atom comes closer to the ion, it pulls the ion away from the trap center into finite micromotion regions. And then energy will be transferred from the driven motion into the, into the uh, thermal motion of the ion and that would prevent the ion from thermalizing with, with the atoms. The associated energy scale is written here and two things that you can notice right away is that one, the energy scale depends on the mass ratio between the atom and the ion. If you choose an ion which is much, much heavier than the atoms, if Mi is much larger than Ma, then this energy scale would become smaller. In other words, if momentum transfer in a collision between the atom and the ion is inefficient, then this mechanism would be shut off to a large extent. Secondly, if you're using very weak traps, omega here is the harmonic frequency of the trap. If you're using weak traps and slowly go towards the, you know, the free atom, uh, free ion case, again, this, this energy transfer is gonna be, is gonna be small. Uh, so we set out to measure this, this effect. The way we did this experiment is we cooled the ion to the ground state of the trap in all three dimensions. Then we overlapped it with a cloud of ultra-cold rubidium atoms at microkelvin temperatures. And what we've seen is that we started with the ion uh, at a temperature of well, actually well below one, half a millikelvin. But as the number of Langevin collisions increased, we actually saw that the ion heats up. It didn't only heat up, it acquired an energy distribution which was non-thermal. It actually acquired an energy distribution which was quadratic, okay? And we could see the power law of the distribution going down from uh, being very large, which reproduces Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, into being about four, okay, at steady state. And four 
means that if I look at the probability distribution of energies, I have a probability distribution that looks like e squared over e to the fourth power, which goes like 1 over e squared. 1 over e squared is a distribution which doesn't even have an average. All its moments diverges. It's a distribution which is completely dominated, dominated by, by extreme events. By the way, the reason the distribution we measure here is so radical is because we choose to work with strontium plus and rubidium, which have almost exactly the same mass. Okay, if you would choose to work with an atom which is much lighter than the ion, you would get a distribution that resembles a thermal distribution to a, greater, to a much greater extent. Since then, people have investigated theoretically this parallel distribution extensively, and you know, a few things to say about this uh, parallel distribution. One is, you know, why would you get something which is not a, get, not a normal distribution to begin with? Normal distributions really come about when you build a, a, a random variable out of a sum of many, many uncorrelated random variables. And then you have the central limit theorem that tells you that what you're going to get is, is a, a Gaussian distribution. That's what happens when we think of thermalization you know, in, in the normal sense. You have many, many collisions, but the energy transferred in each of the collisions is uncorrelated to the energy that was transferred in a previous collision. Here, that's not the case, because if we did transfer energy in one collision, the amplitude of secular motion of the ion and the chap would be larger, meaning it'll, it'll explore higher RF regions, which means that the energy it can get in the next collision can be larger and proportional to the energy it got in the previous collision. This is a multiplicative random process, and that's the engine between these parallel distributions. It's a little bit like an all-in casino, right? I, have, I bet all my money. If I win, I bet all my money. If I win, I bet all my money. Of course, I can lose all my money. But all I need is about a streak of 10 successful wins, and I'm going to be stinking rich, right? So, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the amount of money I'll, ha I'll win is going to be way above the most frequent uh, uh, result. Parallel distributions are actually very abundant in, uh, in nature. You see them uh, actually in stock markets, in ecology, in many, many correlated, correlated systems. These parallel distributions have diverging moments. To those of you who are old enough in the crowd to remember velocity selective coherent population trapping you know, back in the 1990s or so, or 80s, um, people were speaking about the, the resulting uh, velocity distributions which are dominated by levy flights. This is a very similar uh, mathematics. Uh, right, so th these are the energy distributions that depend on the atom ion mass ratio. And this mechanism is really uh, a, a strong preventer in our ability to take these systems and drive them into the ultra-cold regime. You remember that I've told you that the ultra-cold regime is a tens of nanokelvin. Nevertheless, uh, this mechanism prevents, it keeps us at the millikelvin scale. So a factor of about 10 to the 4 in, in terms of energy above the ultra-cold regime. So in the next of the talk, what I'd like to describe is two directions in which, despite this mechanism, people have been able to go into the ultra-cold regime. The first solution people find is to actually use, you know, what, what I told you a, a few minutes ago, use a highly mass imbalanced mixture of ions and atoms. So this is an example from the Geritzma group in Amsterdam, where uh, they, they are using ytterbium plus ions you know, 180 almost atomic or 170 atomic mass units, a chubby atom, and they collide it with lithium, with ha which has nine atomic mass units, a very slim ion. And then uh, um, the momentum transfer in this collision is very inefficient. Therefore, the energy scale associated with coupling driven motion to secular motion is much smaller. The other added value is that the reduced mass of this mixture in the center of mass is much lower. It's actually dominated by the light lithium. And therefore, if you look at the energy to enter the S-wave scattering regime, it's not in the tens of nanokelvin range. It's actually at 10 microkelvin. So you win on both ends. It's much easier to take your system into the S-wave scattering regime. And by using this mixture, indeed, the Geritzma group were able to show how a spin exchange cross-section deviates from being energy independent. You remember I told you that classically, the Langevin, cross the Langevin rates are energy independent. In this case, the Langevin rate was energy dependent in a very clear signature of, of quantum dynamics. Another example is an experiment that was done by the Schatz group in Freiburg, again using barium, 
a heavy ion together with lithium. Lithium is the, is this, the favorite of this, of this approach. Uh, and here they were able to show that by scanning the magnetic field, they see deep resonances. These resonances actually belong to S wave scattering and P wave scattering. So it's not a single partial wave, but nevertheless, we see quantum resonances in the cross section between, between ions and atoms. Uh, again, using a highly imbalanced field. Uh, in the rest of the talk, so I keep saying the rest of the talk, but the rest of the talk keeps getting shorter, so don't worry about it. Um, I want to speak about how we in our group uh, have seen quantum phenomena, even though we are stuck. We use same mass, so a completely mass balanced mixture. We're limited by this heating mechanism, so that means that we're stuck at at least 100 microkelvin or so of, of energy. The S wave scattering temperature is, is you know, 100, 100 nanokelvin or so. So we were very far away from the S wave scattering regime. Nevertheless, we do see quantum signatures um, in our, in our uh, scattering cross section. The uh, dynamics we're looking at is that of spin dynamics. So we take the ion, it's a spin one half system. We immerse it in a class of rubidium atoms, also a spin system. Actually, it's a spin one or spin two system, depending on the hyperfine state we choose, and then we look at the dynamics of that ion impurity when it's immersed in, in that rubidium cloud. So here is the experiment we did. We took the ion and we initialized that either in the plus one half or the minus one half state. These are the two states. So this is the probability of being in the, in the spin down state, in the minus one half state. We initialize this probability either at the 100% or the 0%, and we compare two situations. One situation in which we initialize rubidium at the stretch state of the F equal one manifold. So the spin of rubidium has a preferred direction. Or we initialize the rubidium spin at the M equals zero state where the rubidium spin does not have a preferred direction. And we see that if rubidium spin has a preferred direction, the spin of the ion aligns itself collisionally with the spin of rubidium after about 10, 10 or so collisions at the 90% level. Okay, so the ion spin is being collisionally pumped to align itself with the, with the spin of, of the atomic cloud. Whereas if the spin of iridium doesn't have a preferred direction, we very quickly, or after a similar number of collisions, we find the ion spin depolarizes completely. It has a 50% probability of being the up state and down state. From that rate, we can actually extract the spin exchange uh, cr cross section. It's about 10% per Langevin collision or probability which means that after about nine Langevin collisions, the atom and ion exchange their spin. But there's also some coupling of spin to orbital angular momentum. That's the reason this doesn't happen at the 100% level, and that happens after about 50 Langevin collisions. Now this is actually kind of cool because when you have that and you can control the spin of the ion through the interaction with the atoms, you can actually control through the spin polarization of the atomic cloud, you can uh, control the rate with which chemical reactions occur. So for example, remember that charge exchange reaction I've shown you in that little movie of the eight ions losing fluorescence slowly. That happens because of radiative decay from the entrance channel of the collision to the ground state of that, of, of that molecule. Now the ground state of a molecule is a singlet state. That's the ground state of, of the strontium atom. Now the excited state can be either a singlet or a triplet state. But radiation, the emitted photon, can only couple a singlet state to a singlet state. It can't couple a triplet state to a singlet state. And therefore, we expect that the overlap with a singlet state would determine the rate at which charge exchange occurs, and that's exactly what we measure here. We measure that the charge exchange when, rate, when we, when we initialize at 1, 0, or at 1, minus 1, determines the rate of that chemical reaction. So this is an example of spin-controlled atom ion chemistry. Now, how do I think of these uh, spin exchange uh, collisions or, or, uh, or, or reactions? So spin exchange takes up-down and transfers it into down-up. Now, I can think of the uh, down-up as the odd superposition of the singlet and the triplet states. And I can write the up-down as the even superposition of the singlet and the triplet states. Now, the reason that up-down becomes down-up is because as the ion and atom collide, they collide on a superposition of the singlet and triplet states. 
Now, during the collision, they acquire a phase shift between these two states, and that phase shift turns up down into down up. Okay, it's a phase which is accumulated between the triplet and the singlet state. Again, if I would like to calculate, at least semi-classically, the cross-section for such uh, an interaction to occur, I have a, a prefactor of a matrix element square connecting my input to a, my output state with some spin times spin, the product of two spin operators. But then again, I take the 4 pi over k prefactor, sum over all the partial waves until the maximum partial waves I, 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 my energy allows for, 2L plus 1 prefactor, then sine of a phase. But this time, instead of just the phase over the potential that I collide, it's a phase difference between the singlet and the triplet, the phase difference between these two. That would give me my spin exchange cross-section. And again, if I have many, many partial waves semi-classically, this would average, the sine square factor would average to 1 half, and I will get my semi-classical spin exchange uh, cross-section. The probability, or this matrix element, is about 10%, uh, and that's actually consistent for our states. That's consistent with what we measured, if you remember, about 10% per Langevin collision. The thing is, we don't know, we don't know the, the singlet uh, to triplet potential difference a priori. We don't know what the phase difference here is. But if it averages to one half, it doesn't matter. So when we looked at the, uh, at the results of our, of, our, um, of, of our experiment, and we did that with, uh, with Timur Cherbul and Masato Morita from Reno University, and these are you know, molecular structure and, and scattering uh, theoreticians, just to make sure we understand, we asked them to vary the difference between the singlet and the triplet in their calculations. And what we found to our astonishment is that when we looked at the, at the cross-section for spin exchange, it actually oscillated very, very coherently, extremely coherently. You get a sine function that goes all the way to zero, 100% contrast, which is completely not what you expect to get if the sine of, of this term averages to one half. And we have, at our energies, about 20 partial waves involved. So how come do we see such a coherent behavior? So we looked at, these, uh, at, at, at the potentials that we have. And now, you know, through some uh, relatively naive wave function integration, calculated the phase that we get on the triplet and the phase that we get at the singlet. So what you see here in, in red and blue data points is the sine square of these two phases. And you see that for both the singlet and the triplet, we actually sample randomly the interval between zero and one, okay? There's no, there's no particular phase. This is what you expect when you're not in the S-wave regime. However, when we looked at the phase difference between them, the phase difference between them was completely locked. It did not change at all. It was completely independent from the partial wave we were using. And it took a little bit of time until we understood this S-wave-like behavior with many partial waves. What we see here is quantum interference. We see an S-wave-like behavior, however, completely outside the S-wave regime. You know, a temperature which is 10 to the 4 times larger than the, the, the ultra-cold uh, threshold. The reason for that is that spin exchange is, is controlled by short-range physics. It's controlled by the, uh, the difference between the, the singlet and the triplet, that happens at about 10 or 20 bohr. Very, very short distances, okay? At these distances, different partial waves look exactly the same. And the reason for that is that the centrifugal forces act very, very far away. If you remember, because of the minus one over r to the fourth potential, centrifugal forces act at a quarter of a micron away from the center of the origin. So it's true that the phase you accumulate by, uh, on different partial waves, for example, on the triplet state, is completely random. But that random factor occurs at distances very, very far away, at hundreds of nanometers from the origin. Chemistry occurs at, at regions where all partial waves behave the same. Centrifugal forces don't act at these distances. And this is the reason you get this beautiful interference even though you have several partial waves. It's a separation of length scales type phenomena. So, you know, using this uh, formalism, we could also show that with 20 partial waves, we actually expect to see, uh, to see shape resonances when we scan the energy of, of the ions across uh, of the atoms, or the energy of the collision, if you like. So we'll be able to see shape resonances, even though we have many, many partial waves. 
So again, this is our machine. In order to be able to, uh, to measure these, uh, these collisions, what we did is we now left the ions in the, opt in the optical uh, lattice. We changed the frequency between the two lattice beams to scan um, the velocity of the, of the atoms as they pass across the ion. We made sure that the, ion, the atom's density is very low such that we have about uh, one collision uh, per pass. With this type of, uh, with this type of um, machine, we're also able to measure the elastic collision cross-section. So very shortly we do that by injecting very strong micromotion into the, uh, into the ion, and then a single collision heats the ion so much so we can actually measure it. So the probability here uh, of heating the ion as a function of the micromotion saturates at the Langevin collision probability per pass. So we know what the Langevin probability is. And now we want uh, to try and measure these, uh, these, these, um, th these quantum interference effect. Now we can't really change uh, the energy difference between the singlet and the triplet uh, states, right? That would be really great. If we had a knob that would change the difference between the singlet and the triplet, and then we would measure the cross-section follow a sine function. We can't do that. What we can do, though, is change the isotope of strontium ions that we use. If we measure the spin exchange probability over an isotope chain, the different isotopes would have a slightly different singlet to triplet gap. If we're in the classical regime, again, this doesn't matter. We expect to see the same uh, cross-section. If we're in the quantum regime, we expect to see a variation between the different isotopes. So we need to measure over a different isotopic chain. Problem is, we don't have control over all isotopes of, of strontium plus. So in order to be able to measure, we actually borrowed an idea that was used in the quantum log in, in, in the spectroscopy world. That's the idea of quantum logic spectroscopy. In quantum logic spectroscopy, you take one probe uh, ion. That's an ion that you have full control over. You can initialize it, you can measure it, you can do anything you, you want in terms of coherent control to that ion. And you take another ion that you can't really control it, but you can't interrogate it using light. You can't perform spectroscopy on it. And then by the mechanical action of spectroscopy on that ion, you measure the transfer of momentum, if you like, to the logic ion, and this way interrogate the likelihood of spectroscopy with that, uh, with that spectroscopy ion. Okay, and there are several variations on these ideas. And today these ideas are really advancing very fast. They're used in the most precise ato optical atomic clocks. They're used in order to, to perform spectroscopy on molecular ions. It's very difficult to coherently control molecular ions or laser cool them. It's used in order to perform spectroscopy of highly charged uh, ions. So it's a very, very powerful and, and popular tool. In our system, we follow the same ideas. We have two ions. One is a logic ion, strontium-88+. We can initialize it. We can detect it. We can control it fully. And the other ion is a chemistry ion. Okay? We can't control that ion at all. And then we pass the atoms across this ion crystal. Any collision of the atoms with a chemistry ion would show up in the momentum that was transferred, especially if this collision is, is an inelastic collision and it's exothermal. So if energy was released in this collision, we will be able to measure the effect of this energy release on the, on the logic ion. We use this method in order to measure the spin exchange probability over four different isotopes of strontium plus, strontium-88, strontium-86, strontium-84, and strontium-87. And we've seen that while the cross, spin exchange cross-section for all the even isotopes of strontium was similar, the odd isotope had a significantly different uh, cross-section. Now again, together with, uh, with theory colleagues of ours, Max Valesky, uh, Valevsky, Matthew Fry, and Michal Tomza from Warsaw University, who calculated the spin exchange cross-section for these different species, what they've seen is that if you calculate the cross-section uh, for spin exchange versus the reduced mass, you see oscillations. You don't know a priori what the phase of the oscillations is. It's actually fixed by the singlet to triplet energy gap. Um, 
but what they have seen is that while we don't know what the phase of these oscillations, you know the period of the oscillations rather accurately, and the period of that oscillation is exactly two atomic mass units. And because it's two atomic mass units, you actually expect all even isotopes to have the same cross-section and the odd isotope to have a, a, a cross-section which is at antiphase. And that means that if this picture is correct, and this is again preliminary data and, and calculations, we will be able to extract the S-wave scattering length and all the quantum scattering parameters from a measurement that is done using uh, 20 partial waves. So this is, uh, as far as I know, a first experimental observation of S-wave behavior far ups outside the S-wave regime. So another example, and I'm not going to dwell on all of that, is we've looked, you know, on top of spin exchange, we look at charge exchange reactions. We, in our logic spectroscopy experiment, we used, again, strontium-88 as a logic ion, rubidium-87+, plus, which is a noble gas. You can control it with lasers. As a, um, as, as a chemistry ion, we measured charge exchange reactions, and we've seen the charge exchange reaction is about an order of magnitude below the Langevin cross-section, which again is an indication of, of strong quantum suppression. Um, I'm going to skip the last part of the talk due to uh, time shortage, and I'll just sum up and say that, um, you know, the, maybe I'll, I'll summarize in, in words. Um, you know, the community of atom ion uh, experiments has started, you know, a little over 10 years ago with a clear intention of going into the quantum regime. Qu going into the quantum regime with these systems is much more difficult. It's much more difficult because the quantum regime is it's, it's much lower energies and because the presence of RF fields in the trap is, is a strong impedance you know, in this route. It pumps energy into the system uh, more and more. Nevertheless, people have been able to get initial glimpses of quantum scattering in these systems one avenue is to really try to go to very large imbalance atom ion mass ratios and go to the S-ray regime. Another method which we followed takes advantage of that situation. So the reason that we have very low uh, S-wave scattering energies is because of the long range nature of the potential. It's because you needed the Broglie wavelength which is on the order of a quarter of a micron. The upside of that situation is that many physical reactions occur at chemical uh, uh, distances, which are way shorter than that uh, length scale. And that's why with these systems, even though you have a much higher temperature and you're not at all in the S-wave scattering regime, you still observe S-wave-like behavior. That's the other. Uh, I'll end by saying three things. Uh, one is that we do in our group many other things. So this is one area of research that we have in our group. We also work on quantum computing and simulations. Uh, we have activity in quantum metrology and optical atomic clocks, also directed to new physics searches, similar to things that uh, Michael, Michael and his group were, were doing. And we also have an experiment, this is in collaboration with Neil Davidson group, studying mediated interactions in Bose-Fermi mixtures. So there are many areas of common interest between what we do at the Weizmann Institute and what you do here and hence the, um, the formal collaboration between your center and AMOS, which is our center of uh, atomic molecular and optical sciences. I would also like to thank my group. This is a recent group picture uh, at the Weizmann Institute. And I'll end by showing this. This is uh, the beach of uh, uh, Nitzanim, which is about 20 minutes drive away from the Weizmann Institute. Um, and the reason I'm showing it is that if any of you is interested in, in spending time in warmer weather, then we have available PhD and, and postdoc positions. And let me know if you're interested. I'll have you uh, come and visit and get a, 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 a direct um, impression of, of our activities. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. <laughs>